So we are very pleased to have today with us Professor Stephanie Rossit from the University of East Anglia. Professor Rossit did um, a UG BSc in psychology at the University of Algarve in Portugal and then a PhD at the University of Glasgow in the UK with Professor Monica Harvey in psychology. In her PhD, she started investigating stroke patients who suffered from visual neglect. She then moved to Canada to do a postdoc with Professor Mel Goodale and Professor Jody Calham at Western University, where she studied visual motor control with exciting scanner setups. She is now back in the UK and is an associate professor at the School of Psychology in the University of East Anglia. She is an executive committee member of the British Neuropsychological Society, an editor for the Journal of Co Cogent Psychology in the Neuropsychology section, and a consulting editor for the Journal of Experimental Psychology, Human Perception and Performance. She is a chartered psychologist and an associate fellow of the British Psychological Society. Her research focuses on perception, attention, and action in healthy and in, and in individuals with brain damage or neurological disorders. She uses different methods to study these issues, including cognitive and neuropsychological assessments, rehabilitation, neuroimaging techniques as fMRI, virtual reality, motion tracking, and more. In her research, she aims to investigate how the brain supports perception, action and attention, how these processes are affected by aging and brain disease, and she wishes to develop and test novel complex interventions for cognitive rehabilitation. So I'd like to welcome you, Stephanie, to our seminar to tell us about your exciting research. And thank you so much for this opportunity and for joining us. Thanks, Sharon, for in inviting me and having me speak about our work and very big introduction. Um, so um, I thought I'd have some images of Norwich for the people who've never been here. We're just across from Amsterdam in the UK. And this is a photo of our campus here on the right hand side. And this is of the city centre is a lovely place. So if you come to the UK, come visit us. We're very, very welcome. So um, today I'm going to talk about some very basic neuroimaging studies that we've done, not so much the applied work, and focusing specifically on tool use and tool use knowledge or representations. And before I begin, I just want to thank uh, the students in the lab who've done the work. So Annie Warman, Courtney Mansfield, Deanna Tonin, Ethan Knights, and also my collaborator, Fraser Smith, who's also at the UEA and the funders as well. So in, in our everyday life, um, we um, have endless experiences with objects. We're constantly touching things and interacting with objects. And there's this beautiful book uh, who, by a photographer, artist, Paula Zocotti, who we're starting to collaborate with here. And she's made a visual record of the objects that people touch uh, in 24 hours kind of snapshots. And you can see here that uh, Gemma, who's a cook in Marrakesh, has touched a lot of food and a lot of cooking instruments, but also a scooter because she's a mother like me, so she has a small child. So through these experience that we touch these objects, we learn how they feel, you know, how they look and how we use them. So it's quite a big part of our lives. And you can see the objects are really different from prof profession to profession or even perhaps countries. So this is a, a day in the life of David, who's a third generation cowboy in, in America. And you can see that he's got quite different objects that he's touched in 24 hours, but he also has tools. I can see some tools there on the right bottom corner. And while I know they're tools because they have a handle, um, I don't know how I would use them. So this is why tools are quite special because they are, manipulable objects, which we've invented, so they're manufactured by humans for a specific function and use. So they're tightly linked to um, action routines and function. So for example, you'd never use a bottle opener to whisk your eggs, um, for example, so that there's very specific actions and functions with each of those tools. And already from the work of James B. Gibson in the 70s, there was some suggestions that merely viewing a tool should automatically evoke this affordance related to its use. 
So um, he argued that perhaps you don't perceive objects by their basic, you know, perceptual features, but more by how you um, you would use them. So you process them in that way. And we also know from a range of theories of grounded cognition uh, that people have argued, such as Alex Martin and so on, that object concepts are should should be represented or are thought to be represented in the neural substrates involved in both perceiving but also in interacting with those objects. So from this, you could suggest, well, maybe perception triggers action representations. Um, and in fact, there is a range of neuroimaging studies. So here I'm just showing a kind of, um, you know, cartoon of the activations uh, across many studies. You can see that if you view pictures of tools or pretend to use tools or hear tool sounds or even view 3D tools or act 3D tools, the activations are in quite similar places in the brain. And interestingly, we also know that um, the activation of seeing images of ants and pictures uh, also overlap with the activations of seeing tool pictures. So this is without the actions as people aren't moving, they're just basically seeing photos. So what does this mean? So it's unclear, however, what kind of representation these blobs contain in the brain. What are they actually doing? Are they coding a general action kind of processing or do they have specific a codes related to using the object, how you manipulate it, how you use it, how you move it, and so on. Um, so in contrast kind of to the grounded theories of cognitions, there's kind of a series of perception action models that say that there's kind of three streams in the brain for processing objects. So with regards to tools, we obviously know that um, the ventral visual stream um, um, is quite important for object recognition and perception. So it could uh, uh, help us recognize that hammer, for example. But then information about how to grab the tool, uh, for example, to move it somewhere. So if you put your knife and fork in the dishwasher, for example, uh, you're not using it, you're just grabbing it to put it somewhere. This would be processed by areas in the dorsal, dorsal stream. So these areas are thought to code the structural manipulation knowledge of tools. So how you grab them uh, to move them. Whereas the ventral dorsal areas in dark blue here, so including like supermarginal gyrus, middle temporal gyrus, those are thought to be involved in tool use processing. So how you actually move the object to achieve the function associated with it. For example, doing this movement with a hammer. So we were interested in kind of testing these hypotheses and trying to understand within these tool use regions or tool processing regions, what kind of information they contain. So we set out to do this, and it was work by Annie and Diana uh, by uh, testing two tasks in the scanner. So we had participants view pictures of tools and some runs and other runs pretend to use the tools uh, without the tool in the hand and cued by words. So they didn't see a picture in this case, they just saw the word key, for example, and they had to kind of pretend to use the key with the hand. And the questions we were interested in were basically two. So can action properties evoked by images or pantomime um, be decoded from these perceptual and sensory motor regions? So that was the first question. Can we decode um, the action properties from images or actions in these regions? And uh, are the activity patterns used to represent these properties um, associated with images um, the same or similar to the activity patterns when you actually pretend to use these um, tools. So we wanted to see if we can decode these information, how similar is the activity pattern between the two tasks. So to do this, we spent quite a bit of time to select the stimulus set we would uh, test uh, in the different tasks. So we, we, we did lots of surveys with participants, and in the end, we ended up with these uh, eight tool identities, uh, which afforded different um, kind of functional manipulation ac actions. So half of our tools afforded a squeeze action like this, so for example, the tongs or the peg, and uh, the other half afforded rotation movements. 
These are the pictures that we used. And importantly, uh, in all the analysis that we did, we paired the tools uh, when they were matched for grip so that any effects we found weren't to do with the difference between just this and this, but actually it was um, controlled for that in the analysis. So they saw the images of these objects or different exemplars and the, and the view runs. And in the pantomime, they just saw the names of the objects and then pretended to use them. So just to kind of give you uh, an overview, these are all the exemplars of the stimuli we used. So as you can see, they were all presented in the same orientation in black and white to match as much as possible for the visual properties. Obviously, we can't control for everything, but we did our very best. Um, and then in the pantomime, they were just lying in the scanner and they saw a word uh, via projector. And here the, you'll see in a minute, hopefully, the person just needs to pretend to use here is the screwdriver in the scanner. And we, before people went in the scanner, we trained them about the movements. We made sure they knew the words that we were using and they knew what the tool was and they were familiar with them. This is the timing of the two kinds of runs we had. So we use the 10 seconds on, 10 seconds off block design um, because this is kind of shown to be quite powerful for MVPA um, and also uh, Bern and Bonatini have shown that it's quite good when you're having movements in the scanner uh, for reducing the motion artifacts. Um, and um, as you can see, the runs were almost identical apart from in the view task you saw the different exemplars obviously on and off during the on uh, run whereas in the pantomime you added an, an additional 500 milliseconds before um, the movement was performed or before the block uh, that said the name of the tool so they saw key for example and then the fixation would go green for them to move and red to stop and then move again. So they did five repetitions per block. For every participant, we also collected an independent visual localizer. And here, because we are interested in these two and hand selective areas, we borrowed uh, Stefania Bracci's localized, localizer. Um, and in essence, they view images of tools and hands and bodies, objects or chairs and scrambles. And this allowed us to localize uh, for each individual participant um, uh, regions that are selected for tools or selected for hands, uh, objects and so on in both the lateral occipital temporal cortex and intraparietal sulcus. But uh, in addition, we also run um, an independent contrast across all the movements to localize more sensory motor regions. So here we wanted to localize motor cortex, so much sensory cortex, free motor cortex, supermarginal gyrus, which weren't easy for us to identify from our visual localizer. So we did this independent contrast of all movements versus baseline to find these areas. So in terms of the analysis, uh, I hope I can explain this clearly. So um, we have the view runs and the pantomime runs. So for each run, we wanted to decode tool identity. So which object did the participant see? So in this case, we extract the voxel activity patterns for each region of interest. And we enter it in the classifier and try to classify in this case, screw versus key. But in this case, in this pair, as you can see, they're matched for functional manipulation. So how you would move the object to use it and also for grip. So we try to match them for the action associated with them as much as possible while they have a different identity. So that's what we try to do. So in essence, tool ID can also be referred to as object shape, for example. And then the other classifier, which is the one of interest here, is we wanted to um, decode um, the use, so the action associated with using the object, so the functional manipulation knowledge. So in this case, we're trying to uh, decode a squeeze, um, a squeeze versus rotation action, so tongue versus screwdriver. So the objects are matched for grip. Obviously, they have different identities. Uh, we can't really control for that, but they're at least matched for grip. 
And um, in order to compare the different ROIs, the properties and the tasks, so we can see whether, for example, tool use knowledge is decoded above object shape in certain ROIs, we fed everything through an ANOVA where we compare 12 regions, two properties, so tool ID versus function and the task viewing and pantomiming. In addition, we also try to train the classifier on view, so cross classification in view and test in pantomime and vice versa. So to see whether the patterns were similar between the two tasks in each of the regions of interest. We did this both at the region of interest level, and then I'm also going to show you the whole brain uh, throughout the brain to see what else would come up. So now I'm going to show you the results of the tool ID decoding. So this is object shape. And here um, in orange, I'm showing you the violent plots for the view task. So seeing pictures of the different tools. And in blue, it's the pantomime task. So here they see the words, there's no pictures, and they have to pretend to use the tool without the tool in hand. And what we found, uh, I've also split the ROIs in terms of ventral, uh, ventral dorsal or dorsal dorsal on the other side, just for clarity. What we found is that um, we could decode the pictures. So tool ID from pictures, from viewing uh, in the usual suspects. So the lateral occipital temporal cortex, posterior MTG, supermarginal gyrus. And uh, we could also decode tool identity from the pictures in the pantomime run. So not from pictures, from the movements in the pantomime run. So in blue, across uh, pretty much all the sensory motor ROIs as well. In addition, we found that view decoding was significantly higher than pantomime decoding, only in more ventral regions, such as LOTC objects and LOTC hands. And kind of the opposite pattern was true for more sensory motor areas. So for example, S1 and M1 showed significant higher decoding for pantomime than view, which also is a good sanity check um, it, because they're actually moving in this. What's interesting is that SMG and also LOTC hands were the only two areas where we could decode above chance, you know, object shape from both pictures and actions. Um, so the, that, that's quite interesting because that's the only two areas where we could do that above chance. Stephanie, can I ask a question? Yes, go on. Um, are these decoding accuracies um, across the whole uh, sets of, um, uh, you know, pairs of tools and stuff? I mean, this is the average across participants and also, but for each participant across all the potential uh, um, tools, right? Yes. So what mm -hmm. okay. was that? Sorry, I should have explained that better. Was no, that no, it's okay. <laughs> We did the pairs, you know, match for the properties, and we ran the decoding that way, and then we average across the participants. So that okay. is a kind of control for any differences in biomechanics, for example. Mm -hmm. Wonder. Okay, thank you. No mm -hmm. worries. And I should have said chance levels 50% as well on the dotted line there. So here is the functional manipulation knowledge. So same graphs, but showing you the different decoding analysis. Um, so here we're decoding how you move the tool to use it from pictures or pantomimes. And uh, similar to the previous analysis, we could decode um, above chance in the view tasks, so viewing pictures and the ventral areas, but here also in the dorsal dorsal areas. So from simply viewing pictures, even in S1, we can decode uh, how to use the object, like the properties like squeeze versus rotation movements. And then in the pantomime, so without pictures, we could decode pretty much anywhere uh, how to use a picture, also uh, sensory motor cortex, but also from uh, the ventral ROIs. And, um, oh, sorry. And then there's quite a lot of areas, as you can see, that show a similar decoding above chance for both view and pantomime. Um, and interestingly, Again, we find this pattern when in LO regions, you have higher decoding for view than pantomime. And in sensory motor uh, cortex, you have higher decoding for pantomime than view. So again, kind of makes sense because they're moving. 
But more interestingly, uh, in LOTC hands and LOTC objects, the functional properties, so the pairs that we matched for so um, um, squeeze versus rotation actions, we could decode them from LOTC objects and LOTC hands. And this decoding was above two identity or shape. And in pantomime, we could do that um, in, uh, again, LOTC hands, but also in uh, quite a large range of dorsal-dorsal areas. Um, so just to kind of highlight again, similar to the previous analysis, LOTC hands again, so the visual selective area that cares about pictures of hands, um, it was the only area where we could decode function or use of a tool above object shape or tool ID uh, for both tasks. So the, as I said, now I'm gonna show you the whole brain search slide. Uh, we tried to do cross decoding just for information, both in ROI and whole brain, but there was no significant above chance decoding or cross decoding across tasks. So training on view, testing on pantomime, we didn't find any significant effects or the other way around. So here we just run the same analysis. So object shape or tool ID across the brain and the results kind of confirm the ROI analysis. So we can decode in the view runs when they see images quite well in lateral occipital kind of uh, ventral areas. And in the pantomime runs that switches to more sensory motor cortex. And then for functional manipulation knowledge, uh, we find a larger swath uh, of activation as, or of decoding, as you can see here. But again, it fits the ROI analysis um, in that, you know, for view is decoding again in the ventral areas and for pantomime more sensory motor cortex. But what's interesting here is that we have an overlap between the two. So while we can't say that the patterns are the same between the two tasks, these do spatially overlap um, between the two tasks. So here in purple, you can see, so if I just take everything away and just show you where does the decoding overlap spatially, you can see that for both these tasks, we have decoding in somatosensory cortex, so fit in the ROI analysis, um, IPS, even LO, uh, for this functional knowledge decoding. So what do we think this means? So we think that our data shows that viewing pictures of tools uh, does seem to trigger this kind of retrieval of action information within both ventral and dorsal visual areas. Uh, so simply viewing pictures of tools, you can decode action properties in essence. And this retrieved information seems to be detailed enough to actually contain information on how you would move your hand to use the tool. And um, even in S1, uh, we can represent um, this knowledge or this representation simply when people are shown images of objects, which kind of fits with uh, previous work from Smith and Goodell and more recent work by Bailey and all. But interestingly, pantomiming tool use also seems to trigger these action representations and across both ventral and dorsal areas. So that doesn't seem to be a strong division here. However, as I showed you, there just seems to be a kind of a gradient or a dissociation. So when you view uh, images, you have higher decoding in ventral visual areas in view than pantomime. And the opposite is true for more sensory motor parietal frontal areas. And you have higher decoding of functional knowledge as well in dorsal than ventral areas for pantomime. And the opposite is true for view. So it seems like these areas can contain both uh, all of this information, but there's a kind of a gradient in how they prioritize this information depending on the task you're doing. Interestingly, LOTC hand was the only region where both tool identity or object shape and function could be decoded regardless of the task the person was doing. And we also found that function decoding, so tool use, tool function was higher than object identity decoding in this area only. So it seems that visual hand selective cortex represents how to use tools, which kind of fits with some of our previous work, which, which I'll show you next. We didn't find any cross decoding from view to pantomime or vice versa. 
So this kind of suggests that while similar regions may represent this functional knowledge about tools for both tasks, because there's an overlap in space and the brain locations, they do so with distinct patterns of activation. So we need to kind of do more research to understand why this is the case. But of course, here I showed you pictures and I showed you pretend actions, but as Jody Cullum would say, who was my postdoc supervisor, it's important to study real actions too. Um, so she did these studies where she compared real and pantomime grasping. And we also know from neuropsychology that pretend actions are activating a different network than real actions. So this is kind of a well-known uh, finding in visual motor uh, science. And as I showed you earlier, these two used studies, you know, most of them are involving pictures and hearing sounds or pretending like we just showed you, but not very many of them actually involve interacting with a 3D tool in the scanner because it's quite hard to do. So it's not easy, but as you will agree, it's quite different, you know, seeing a picture of a whisk and actually, you know, whisking things in a kitchen is a very different kind of action because you're also lying down and, and we're very limited in what we can do in the scanner. So we, we've started doing these kind of studies in Norwich. Uh, so I'll show you one of them, which we published last year, which was led by Ethan Knights. And um, we wanted to find out uh, what kind of information related to a real action with the tool, a 3D object in the scanner, um, what kind of information would be coded in these regions I showed you earlier. So what information do these tool use regions contain um, when you're doing real actions? And for example, do they code information about typicality? And we define typicality on how you would correctly grasp an object for use. So for example, here, you wouldn't really grasp the knife or the pizza cutter by their serrated edges, because that would be dangerous, but also not very functional for you to then use um, the object. So we manipulated typicality that way. So how did we do it? So we borrowed um, a previous paradigm by Ken Foyer and Jody, in which we had people grasp tools um, in a typical or atypical way. So we had these 3D printed objects and there were a spoon, a pizza cutter, because I'm off Italian, a um, knife. And uh, in the typical conditions, they grasp the objects by the handle. In the atypical conditions, they grasp the object by the business end. So you wouldn't really use it if you grasped it that way, you could only move it. So that's the kind of idea. And we had two object categories. We had our tools, which were all 3D printed, and um, the subjects were naive to the typicality manipulation. We told them the study was just about grasping 3D objects. And then to control for any biomechanical differences, we spent quite a bit of time designing these non-tool objects. So um, they are kind of like bars. So we didn't want to use unfamiliar things because then it becomes a whole new compound. We wanted to use things that wouldn't look aberrant, but that would be graspable. And the idea here is that each tool has at its non tool control, which kind of matched for grip aperture. So for example, if you're grasping the business end of the pizza cutter is quite a large grip you have to do. So compared to grasping the handle, so if we found any difference, it could just be due to grip aperture. So then we had the bars, which were kind of controlling for this. And we also controlled for reach distance. So we gave them these black points within each object to make sure the distance was the same across all the objects. And they were also matched for elongation um, so that uh, we know that the dorsal stream cares about these kind of properties. And then obviously all the same material. Um, they didn't actually lift them up, they just reached and touched the objects. So this is the setup that we use, uh, which was um, borrowed from Jody's setup in Canada. Um, so it's a turntable, so the subjects lying in the scanner, they have their head tilted so that they can directly view the objects without the use of mirrors. Um, and we have this turntable which a lot spins and we can attach 3D shapes to it. 
and people have to keep fixation throughout the runs on this LED. Everything's dark here; it's illuminated, but during the actual experiment, it's completely dark. You can't see anything apart from the fixation light over there, and then there's an illuminator that flashes and illuminates the object at certain times. And we have an infrared source so that we can film the hand movements and the eye movements of the participant to check that they're conscious and doing uh, their task. Um, and to get whole brain coverage, we use the posterior half head coil and we suspend a flex, a flex coil over the head, uh, which gives us um, full head coverage there. So, um, and obviously, Eaton was the most important bit of the uh, experiment because uh, he kind of led this study. But you can see that the movements, even though I say a real action, they're limited around the elbow because obviously the more real it becomes, the more motion artifacts you get. So they have a strap around the elbow and they're only making these kind of movements to and from the chest. So again, same block design we used before. And this is just a movie to show you uh, someone doing these grasps on and off here. They're grasping a knife. You can see the little light over there is the fixation. Um, this is speeded up, um, but uh, you can see there's a flash, which is the illuminator there uh, when the light goes on. So this is what it kind of looked like. So in the beginning of the, uh, the block, uh, they heard the cue, and we didn't say, you know, typically typical. We said left, right, so they knew which side of the object to grasp. So that's all they heard, left and right. Um, and then, as you saw, there was a flash of light every time they had to do the action. And then uh, for the tool MVPA, the analysis we run, we have, you know, grasp by the handle or grasp by the atypical end. And then we have the match actions with the non tool. Uh, objects here. And again, we have a visual localizer, which was run independently for each subject, so we could localize all our regions of interest independently from the MVPA data or the main experiment runs. So in terms of the analysis, uh, what we did is similar to the previous experiment. So we have, um, in this case, we're trying to decode the tools. So the actions done with the tools, so typical versus atypical. So you have left, um, sorry, right versus left uh, of grasping the tools. So we extract the voxel activity patterns and we run this decoding. But importantly, here is quite stringent. We then run a paired sample t-test and compare that against the bars. So we're not only trying to find, you know, decoding above chance for the tools, but we're comparing that with the control objects to see wh wh where this information is specific to tool use and not just different, driven by differences in reach direction or biomechanics. So if you think that an area is gonna really, really, be, really be caring about grasping tools correctly for use, then you probably expect them to have higher decoding um, for the tool uh, runs uh, or the tool trials, so typical versus atypical, compared to the non-tool trials. So, and we expected this for the tool and hand selective areas where, where areas that don't care so much about typicality and tool use would show a big difference there. So here I'm showing you again uh, the violin plots of the decoding performance and chances um, 50% again for each of our ROIs. Um, and in white, you have the decoding of typical versus atypical for the tools, um, and in gray for the non-tools, which is just right versus left. And as you can see, we found this difference um, between tool and non-tool decoding in IPS hands and LOTC hands. So we can decode typicality with tools um, for both these regions, and importantly, that's significantly above the control object actions. There was no other region that shown this pattern of decoding. And because we found this difference between um, IPS and IPS tool and the same in LO, we then compared the difference within them um, uh, with uh, an ANOVA as well. The reviewer asked to do this, which was quite informative. So. 
uh, here we're comparing tool versus non-tool difference decoding between hand and tool selective areas. So you can see that while in IPS, there's a big difference um, between um, the hand and the tool selective area, that difference doesn't come out uh, in LO. So this suggests that perhaps the IPS ROI is kind of more strongly involved in this typicality decoding than the LO because the difference is larger there. Uh, and as I said, we looked at all the other ROIs, so I'm showing you here, um, none, of, none of them show this pattern of results. And we also did some control analysis. So we did the same decoding as before, but in S1 or some of sensory cortex. And again, that was not really an effect of, you know, higher decoding for typical of a typical of tools versus the same actions with bars. There was no difference uh, between those two. We could do it for both these situations. So this suggests that the effects aren't simply driven by differences in texture between the objects, because it could be, you know, if you're grasping the business end of the spoon, it feels different than grasping the business ends of the knife, um, but it doesn't seem to have affected the decoding in somatosensory cortex. And then we also try to decode size. So because we had these differences in size between the actions, what we did is we did um, the average uh, decoding between the small, you know, we run the pair, so small objects versus larger across all possible iterations, and we can de decode grip size in any of our ROIs as well, above chance. So it seems that uh, what we found that was that these hand selective areas in both IPS and LO seem to represent how to correctly grasp uh, real 3D tools for use. So kind of matching as well what we, which I just showed you earlier. So it's nice to replicate this with another paradigm. Um, IPS uh, and LO, we already know from previous studies that you can discriminate planned, executed, and even perceived them actions. And we also know that um, you can um, you use these uh, pattern of activity in these areas to discriminate from images, uh, tool-associated actions. This was shown by Peroni et al. already in 2014. So um, our results fit well with this. The neural representations in LOTC hand uh, of amputees become richer as well as protect prosthetic use increases. So we think that this kind of fits well with our finding that perhaps typicality representations of tool grasping, so how to correctly grasp an object for use, uh, seem to be evoked in areas that represent the human hand, so these visual areas. But what about the rest of the brain? So we ran the same analysis recently across the whole brain, and this is a paper that was published last year in Scientific Reports. So again, it's the same analysis at our ROI level, but here across the whole brain. So we've got our tool classifier of typical versus atypical and the non-tool classifier with the biomechanically matched actions, uh, left versus right, and then we subtract those maps between one and the other. Um, and what we found was that um, we could decode and um, uh, interestingly, in anterior temporal cortex, the typicality. So when we did the typicality difference map, so comparing the same actions between tools and non-tools, we found these that the decoding was um, significant above chance in these areas, including the anterior temporal cortex, fusiform gyrus, um, and Spock, as well as MTG and parahippocampal gyrus. Um, and we didn't find um, with this whole brain searchlight any areas in the intraparietal sulcus uh, when we used the cluster corrected map. But if we showed you the uncorrected map, you can see that there is some overlap between at least the IPS ROI, which was our stronger ROI, and uh, some decoding at whole brain level. Obviously, it's not significant at cluster corrected but just to show you that there was something there. So maybe if we had more participants, that would have come out uh, there as well. We also took Steph the- Stephanie, can I, can I ask another question? Yes, go ahead. Uh, sure. In the SPOC, uh, which seems, I, I don't know if it's peripheral vision or perhaps even part of the DMN, um, 
And I was wondering, I mean, you're looking here at uh, the differences between tool and non-tool objects, but um, you could, did you examine, I mean, was it positively activated to tools and to non-tools, but you found that there was a difference or could it just be that you see actually this contrast elicits, it is, is coming up because you've got two levels of deactivation and maybe um, non-tool would be deactivated more. I'm just, because if it's the DMN, you may see that. Um, yeah. just, this is not activation, I guess it's deco it's decoding, Sharon. Oh, this is decoding, sorry. Yes. 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 So it's, mm. it's not like a, a mirror. We did do a univariate analysis as well on the data. Sorry, someone decided to start hammering outside. Um, no, we can't hear the hammering. <laughs> uh, and I cannot quite remember if we had any anything in Spock, if I'm honest. Um, I'm so, just, and uh, was there any difference in the difficulty of the task, do you think? Or it was uh, it was straightforward, both of them were... were... We didn't really have any difficulty, but let me show you the behavioral results. Mm, okay. that. So we motion track the participants lying down in the lab doing the same task. And what we found is that uh, there was no difference between typical and atypical in either reaction time or movement time. So mm -hmm. that means, you know, they were well matched behaviorally. But we yeah. did find was that, you know, doing an action to a tool versus a non-tool, it takes more time overall. Mm. So it seems like you need extra processing for this more complex object, which kind uh -huh. of sense. Thank you. Yes, no worries. But the biomechanics were well matched. And they're not really told, you know, they're just grasping left, right. They're not told anything. So this is quite interesting, I think. So, so what about the rest of the brain? So it seems that um, the anterior temporal cortex, um, which involves both middle temporal gyrus and superior temporal gyrus um, areas, so, so not your sole uh, anterior as you usually see, uh, and the parapocapal gyrus, right fusiform and Spock, as you noted, contain representations of how to grasp 3D tools for use. Uh, so it seems that we found the involvement of the ATL in real action representations. And to our knowledge, no one had found that before with a real action paradigm. There has been quite a lot of claims before, you know, from uh, Maria Spielen, Karamaza, and um, Carolyn Patterson as well, and Matt Lambon Ralph about the ATL storing this general semantic knowledge about tools. Uh, and where uh, a tool is found can also be decoded there and now from images. We also know that a fusiform and Spock um, seem to be involved in semantics or kind of a modal responses. Sorry for the noise. Reading tool words, uh, viewing tool images, or represented uh, representing object kind of associations, um, and are sensitive to prior experience. So they seem to represent typical action routines or object function. So here we were kind of the first people to show it with a real action paradigm, a real object that actually these areas might play a role in typicality uh, in grasping. So this is my final slide to try and my best to bring it together. What we've found out so far about these areas is that it seems that both these ventral visual areas and dorsal areas seem to represent how to use tools. And this is triggered by all kinds of tasks. So viewing pictures, pantomiming, and also real actions. So it's not as simple as, you know, there's a ventral dorsal network that does this and so on. It's obviously more complicated than that. The patterns of activity do follow some kind of sensory modality preference. So if you're doing a view picture paradigm, you will have higher decoding in ventral areas. If you do an action, you have higher decoding in dorsal areas. So the pattern is there. Um, it seems that hand selective cortex, um, especially in intraparietal sulcus um, and LO, um, fusiform, MTG, and Spock um, seem also to represent this to use um, information in a task invariant manner. 
And at least from our studies, though we're currently collecting data um, again on this, um, it seems that the anterior temporal cortex uh, was only triggered by real tool actions. We didn't really find this with pictures or pantomime when we did whole brain searchlight. So we're testing this currently. Yeah, that's it. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. This is uh, really exciting work and I want to invite everybody to unmute yourself and um, give a big um, thank you to Stephanie for the very interesting talk. I see people are have not yet unmuted themselves. Um, is it okay? Are you up to taking questions? Yes, absolutely. Okay, wonderful. So I see that um, Bradford Mahon has a question. Um, you can go ahead. I've got some of my own, but yeah. Well, thank you so much. And um, I just want to say what a wonderful talk it was. And uh, so many questions and comments I would love to share with you. Maybe I can even follow up after offline. Yeah, um, that'd be great. I wanted to ask about... Um, I wanted to go back maybe to the first part of the talk, and you know, I'm 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 particularly curious about the lack of transfer from from pantomime to vision, given how similar the paradigms were, and you know, and I was trying to think, you know, I wonder what um, could be the difference of whether or not you do in fact have transfer, particularly maybe in the super marginal gyrus, which, right, as you know, is the place also that you found, which I found very compelling. Um, I'm curious if you think the stimulus space plays a role in this. And, you know, in, in the studies that that Chen and colleagues did, that we did, that Quan Jing did, um, there were, it was a very sort of sparse space where there are these triplets that were well defined as having certain kinds of manipulation or function relationships. And, um, and I was wondering if that same sort of stratification of the space was present in your stimuli and if you think that can kind of play a role given how sort of task normative the responses in these regions are i have a more behind that but i just would curious to hear your thoughts about that that aspect of it and uh, what you think the difference might be yes absolutely um I was disappointed, if I'm honest, that we couldn't find cross decoding myself, but you know, c'est la vie. Um, but uh, indeed, I think stimulus features play a huge role. And we, we, we were also very careful, you know, in terms of pairing the stimuli a certain way, but obviously we could have, we've tried different pairs and we, we didn't really find any difference, to be honest, um, uh, in terms of like anything in the SMG for cross decoding. It just seems completely flat, even across the whole brain when you run the searchlight. But I guess we're asking something quite hard, you know, from a picture um, to a pretend action. And perhaps what we should try next is to have a 3D object and then acting on it. Um, that might be more powerful or control the phase, you know, plan versus execute and so on. When do these, so, so that'd be quite an interesting follow-up. But in terms of the pairs, you know, we match them for the movements they afforded them. So we did the decoding um, in objects match for grip, uh, for example. So uh, we tried to control the best we could, um, but it's hard to control for everything. And maybe we've controlled too much as well. So it's a, uh, it's quite tricky to design these experiments, as you know. Yeah, I can I ask just a quick follow up. I'm just curious if you think cross object generalization of these multivariate patterns might be a key ingredient for finding cross modal transfer, because cross object generalization, when you ask it to transfer across objects or cross pairs from one pair to another pair, it forces the classifier to focus on that variance which is truly abstracted away from the object itself and it's really about the action associated with that object i don't know if, I haven't if, tried if, that form of analysis that would be interesting. you have not tried that is that right you haven't done cross pair because that's where no. we found the cross modal decoding was with cross pair decoding and 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 maybe we take this offline but my hunch is that there's something about when you push the classifier to do cross pair decoding then those voxels are survive the cross modal test uh at least in our experience with the data that we have 
yeah cool uh that definitely worth the chat more yeah i think uh uh i see what you mean i don't know if i think my phd student might kill me if i ask her to do another decoding analysis but i definitely want to try this one yeah thank you um Stephanie, I want to follow up on uh, Bradford's uh, uh, idea. Um, it's a different direction, not cross pair, but I was thinking whether you may seem some, do you think there's some topography? I mean, you looked at um, predefined ROIs, but you could also not, like you can also look at the peak, you know, within that region for a specific pair. And then do you think you will see some consistent like topography or gradient that for a specific pair you would see? I mean, do you think there's going to be a shift or that's just a thought that I had. And I was also thinking, I mean, the study is, uh, um, well, I wouldn't say limited, but you carefully controlled for, um, you know, the sets and so, and for the visual and for the uh, the function that's used. But do you think um, if you would look at very different types of objects, um, I don't know, a phone or, you know, phone, not very, um, but, <laughs> but, but other things that are, uh, you know, going back to your pr uh, first slides where you showed, um, the different uh, tools and objects that uh, different people use or touch every day. So do you think if you would look at these different types of objects, I'm not uh, talking about the controlling for all the other aspects, do you think you would see, I mean, there would be a shift, you know, anterior, posterior, uh, um, um, or do you think it all happens in this same, you know, ROI that you've uh, identified uh, just I've got more questions, of course. Yes. I, I mean, if I were to do an hypothesis, I guess, of what we've found so far, it seems like this hand selective area is quite special. You know, it's not just us, but also like in the people who have amputations seems to come up over and over again. Um, so across labs, across populations, you know, in fact, here, uh, the, the, the study with the pictures was done in Holland, whereas the study with the real objects was done in the UK. So mm -hmm. um, if, if it's a data-driven hypothesis, I would say, I think the hand selective area perhaps really cares about hand postures and how you position your hand to interact with objects around you. Um, mm -hmm. And tools obviously really care a lot of, really carry a lot of action information. Um, so in that sense. However, you know, I'm not naive to say this is the only area. Um, so I, I think the verdict's out, the experiments are, we're trying to push what we can do in the MRI and bring 3D things in, but they're quite limited um, in the items. So um, working with Paula, we're kind of developing uh, more sophisticated tool sets that vary for other properties. So I look forward to running these studies in the future. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. I've got I more questions, but I, I... Question, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 it's great. Uh, I'll let uh, Joe, do you want to um, ask a question? You've raised your hand. Yes, yes. Uh, Stephanie, nice meeting you. Um, uh I worked with uh, Jody years ago, like 20 years ago, when we first started this stuff. Yes. And uh, while I'm listening to your talk, I have a question, and mainly from Bradford's like questions. Um, some of the stuff I do now looks at expertise. Now, I don't know in the field of tool use, uh, have people played with this, but like mechanics, or I used to be an animal researcher, the tools, instruments I use, I know exactly how to use a scalpel or a suture. So I'm curious, does this area, has anyone looked at this or, or played with this idea where if you have an expertise and you see that tool or act on that tool, does the area show modulation? Yes. Yes, that's exactly what uh, we're kind of doing at the moment, Joe, uh, to try and see, you know, how does this happen? Um, so, yes, very interesting. I don't have an answer for you. Um, we don't know yet, but uh, yeah, definitely interesting. Yeah, what, what I suspect is, so I saw in one of your slides that SMA seems to be more activated and, and M1 for the 
um, pantomime action when they were reaching out, my, my prediction would be that SMA and parts of that network would be even more activated in the expertise. And if you could play around with that, if there, you get like, if you contrast say mechanics and you have tools of a mechanic and you contrast, uh, you know, tools of an experimenter in a lab who, like, or a medical doctor who's a surgeon, and you contrast those, you might see a dissociation in SMA or some other area like, you know, caudate nucleus or basal ganglia. And it'd be super cool if you went deeper in to then be able to say, well, when you're an expert, you are using a tool, it's habits. You don't actually have to think about it much. And, and that would be the cool like leap when you go to expertise. Yes, we know that in amputees, for example, you know, the more they use their prosthetics, so this, the word by Tamar Macken, that, uh, you know, the more they, the tools and hands differentiate um, in the brain. So it, I'm not sure it'll be as simple as higher and lower activation. It might be more a categorical uh, differentiation. <laughs> The yeah, it's definitely super interesting. Yeah, there's a cool study I'll send to you, Calvin Marino did, where they had ballerinas and they had capoeira dancers watch videos of ballerinas dancing in a, like a two-second video or capoeira, and there was a dissociation based on their expertise. So that's a paper you should look up. Uh, it would be cool to see. And it'd be cool to see if the pattern is similar when you jump to people using tools with their hands. Yes. Thank you, yeah. Joe. Oh, nice cool. to meet you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Stephanie, I've got a few more questions. So two, actually, um, although I hope I'm not going to be evacuated from this room soon. So it's forget <laughs> it. Um, Everything so, okay? Yeah, yeah. It's just that the lesson is supposed to start here. I'm not in my usual... Uh, Oh, but anyway, I, um, I wanted to ask if um, you had, if you looked at, I mean, the LOTC that you are uh, referring to, did you by any chance examine whether it may overlap with some of the lesion of the F? Um, I'm just thinking because she was able, she wasn't able to, you know, perceive what that was. I mean, according to the reports, but she was able to use tools, apparently. I'm just wondering, um, you know, relating it to that. And also, I wanted to ask about um, whether you looked at the cerebellum by any chance. Not that I'm an expert in the cerebellum, but I'm thinking, I mean, it's all it's talked about that this is um, a region that has to do with action planning and uh, many aspects. So I wonder if you um, examined anything related to that. I have to confess a crime that I never look at the cerebellum. But no, it's okay. <laughs> yes, but I, I think it's because we can't fit it in, to be honest, with the orientation we have with the head tilted. I'd love to look at it, but I just can't. Mm -hmm. So I have to choose. Um, oh, you haven't scanned it. Include, yeah, we, we can't. We oh. can't. Um, I see. Some people have small heads, so we might just about be able to, <laughs> but uh, most people it's cut out. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, um, okay. It. Yeah. Um, um, but, First question, Sharon, did I forget to answer? Um, um, no, but Brad uh, Bradford um, raised um, his hand again. I don't think there's any, no, no, no question. No, no, that's okay. I just, uh, yeah, it was a DF, just a suggestion to oh, over, to look at the anatomy. But, yes, uh, Debbie has a very big lesion, uh, you know, so it's definitely gonna uh, cover that for sure. Mm. But I've, I've had dinner with the F and tested it quite extensively. And um, obviously she had knowledge about how to use tool pre-lesion. Uh, so that's not gone. She has the concept of a tool. I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, if you put a tool in front of her, she, she obviously won't be able to tell you what it is, but if she touches it, she might. She, she, she probably knows where to grasp it. I'm not sure I'd say that's knowing to use that tool as like first perceptin. Mm. But, I mean, I think she she will be able to do a basic action of grasping and lifting it up. I'm not sure she'll be able to know what it is. Um, just if she moves it, she might work it out using motion cues. That's my experience of working with her. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Bradford, do you want to do you want to uh, have yeah, a go? Well, I put my hand up when you asked your question, and Stephanie, I mean, of course, and and actually, I was going to say with the comment I was going to share, which I think rhymes with what you just said, which is that you know this paper by Carey and colleagues, ninety five or ninety six on end state comfort, and DF does not show, which is what you just said, end state comfort to visual presentation, and which tells us so much about where that information comes from that informs the structure of the grasp. Um, but actually, I, just connected to that, I, if I could just also go back to Joe's uh, question about um, expertise, because in a sense, I was curious, you know, in a sense, we're all experts, right, with some objects, and we have, right, and it's a continuum across different kinds of tools. Um, and how do you think about, um, you know, of course, I, and, and of course, you know, you wouldn't deny that, like, we also can use tools in new ways, and we're not, like, locked into using them just because we have expertise with a particular way of using them. Okay. Is it the same system? So is it the same praxis and functional grasp system that's used for functional use, right? When you use an object according to its function, that's also used when I say, mm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to use the screwdriver to do something that's not screwing a screw because it fits the task. Is it, I'm curious, like what your thoughts are, is it the same system, same processes, or is it a different general purpose system? I don't know, Brad, and we're doing this experiment right now. Uh, in the scanner, we've got people using tools, you know, in the correct movement or incorrect movement, what, what we call incorrect. But um, it would be a really nice experiment, what you're suggesting, where um, there's a proper goal, you know, uh, and we ask them to use the complete wrong thing. Because if you're desperate, you know, I, I didn't have a hammer for a very long time and I was going around with my wooden spoon uh, hammering screws on the wall to put pictures up so totally um and it's it's main and it's maybe a similar area you know um i wouldn't be surprised let's say um that it, it it's the same system but it's quite flexible and there may be some input from memory systems to say okay this is what i got to do this is the movement i've got to do i don't have the right object but i'll just use whatever i got so definitely, yeah, we should do that experiment. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Stephanie, I want to thank you really a lot for this really exciting uh, and inspiring talk. Thank you so much for joining us. And again, um, <laughs> thanks all for thank having you. me. Thanks, Sharon, for organizing. And the questions were really nice. Yeah, great talk. And um, um, we may be going on a semester break, uh, actually. Yeah. Um, so um, I will keep uh, everybody posted on the next um, talks that we're planned have um, for the continuing uh, continuation of the year. So thank you again. Thanks very much, Brad. Let's thank you so much. Chat. Great talk. Yeah. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for letting me crash. <laughs>